Welcome back, folks, to another episode of Two in the Cooler. We've got another excellent one for you. And, of course, as always, we really appreciate you guys watching the show and listening to it. And the, uh, you know, subscribing on YouTube, following us on Instagram. Uh, it's awesome. It really means a lot to us. So we appreciate you guys for doing that. And if you want to support the show even more, the best way to do it is to uh, check out the merch. Okay, the link for that's going to be in this episode description as well as in our Instagram bio. I mean, we've got stuff on there that is top-notch. Okay, you're going to love it. We've got uh, logo hoodies and T-shirts, um, pint glasses, bucket hats. I think we have fanny packs, too, which is perfect for every occasion. Um, whatever you're looking for, you can check that out at snackspot.se slash creator slash teespring.com. We've got merch not just for this show, but also for the other show we produce here, Scheming and Dreaming with Ben and Jake, which is... I mean, I don't, I don't know how to describe it. It's an unbelievable show if you haven't watched it, so you're definitely going to want to uh, check out the merch uh, for them as well. And again, the link's going to be in our Instagram bio in the show description, or you can check it out yourself just straight up at snackspot.se slash creator slash teespring.com. Get yourself something that's going to make you look good and feel good, okay? I would, not go, I would not cheap you out on this merchandise, folks. The t-shirts, I'm talking try blend fabric i say it every time because i can't stress the tri blend enough if it's not tri blend i'm not buying okay so i wouldn't give you something shittier than that that's just, that's just straight up so again snackspot se slash creator slash teespring.com check out the merch there as always we appreciate it imagine if you will a cold snowy night you're inside bundled up maybe you got a mug of hot chocolate you know what would be perfect right now? Something to go with it. Maybe some Oreos. Maybe some Santa's favorites or whatever they call them now. They're those Christmas cookies. They're good any time of year. You go to the cupboard. Nothing. What are you going to do? You're going to let the whole night go to waste? No! You're not going to go back out in that snowstorm, okay? You want to stay comfortable. You want to stay cozy. That's the whole point. Well, you can have it both ways. All you got to do is use Instacart because with Instacart you can get not just groceries okay not just cookies Christmas or otherwise but some of your favorite products from some of your favorite local stores delivered right to your front door in as little as one hour and the best part is right now two in the cooler listeners get free delivery on their first order of $35 or more actually this just in I think it's $10 or more folks all you got to do is spend 10 bucks and Instacart will deliver it right to your front door absolutely free okay why do you want to go to the grocery store anyways it's a terrible place the, just the parking lot of grocery stores is uh, it's like mad max fury road or one of the other movies in the mad max franchise it's terrible avoid all of that you don't want to go inside look around for items oh people running their carts and folks forget it forget it you don't need that in your life okay you don't and you don't have to deal with it you can just use Instacart. Again, right now, two of the cooler listeners get free delivery on their first order of $10 or more. All you have to do is hit the link in the show description and get that deal. Make life a little bit easier on yourself. Stay comfortable. Start using Instacart today. And if you're interested in advertising on this show or our twin show, Scheming and Dreaming, uh, you can email us at snackspotsports at gmail.com for details on how you can start reaching thousands of listeners in the Buffalo area and beyond. Now, it's no secret that podcasting has blown up, uh, especially in the past two years, and with that comes a lot of attention from large companies who want to get in on the action, who want to start advertising on podcasts. Companies like State Farm and, and Tropicana is always one of my go-tos for some reason, but these big companies that... You know, they have ads during, like, the Super Bowl and shit, okay? And I, I'm getting flustered. Classic Andrew Candidate fluster. But the reason I'm getting so angry is because it just makes so much sense to me that it's time for local businesses to get in on the action. And the best way to do that is with us right here at Snack Spot, not just with this show, but also with Scheming and Dreaming and the other shows that we're going to be able to produce. There's a lot of benefits to podcast advertising, obviously, or these large companies wouldn't get involved. So if you're interested on more in more details on all of the um, benefits of podcast advertising, you can email us again at snackspotsports at gmail.com. <laughs> 
Okay, we're going now. Uh, yeah, Jerry, I, I said already, but we really appreciate you talking with us, man. Oh, it's my pleasure. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Jump on, shoot the shit a little bit. Yeah, yeah absolutely. That's what we do. This, uh, yeah, it's just so funny to us though, because when we um, uh, posted that Instagram clip. We were obviously joking with Olivia, who we had on, like, oh, we're going to have the production designer from Fuller House on next week, you know. And next thing you know, boom, you hit us up on Instagram, and we, and we reach out to you and see what's going on. So this is awesome. And I think a lot of people listening are going to be like, oh, man, I can't believe this is, like, they actually. So it's really cool. It's really cool of uh, you, you to do You got to just put, the, put it out there, right? And it comes to you if you put it out there in the way that you want, you know. Yeah, man, that's that's the way it uh, it seems to go. Um, you know, you just got to go for it. I know you obviously have a ton of experience with that. Otherwise, of course, you would not be where you were because you grew up in uh, eastern Pennsylvania, right? I grew up in Greensburg, which is down below Pittsburgh. Oh, okay. <clears throat> I grew then, up in western uh, Pennsylvania. I'm a diehard Steeler fan forever oh, and ever, ever. Well, yeah, okay. That's, you know, I, keep holding know on to can. that. I know. <laughs> You guys being Bills fans and all, I'm sure I know. Yeah. Hey, we're, hey, listen, we're we're allowed to soak up our glory while for as long as we can find it and as we continue to find it. So absolutely, with your new quarterback, you got something to look forward to. For exactly. The first time in a while. And you you guys have Mason Rudolph. Oh my God! Isn't that like a? <laughs> yeah, that's exciting. So that'll could, be good. Could it get, get much worse than that? <laughs> You know, he's been sitting around for years, and you go, okay, now you think he's going to be a starter? He's got that talent? Yeah. No, he probably yeah. doesn't. <laughs> well, I mean, we'll certainly see. They definitely are, you know, you're, you've got a coaching staff that uh, has always found a way to get it done, so so we'll see. Yeah. A lot of time that to figure coaching, that out. That coaching history is nuts, huh? Yeah. Like three coaches in, like, the last 50 years or yeah. something like that. And, and Tomlin's never had a losing season as, as an NFL coach. No. Yeah. No, and I was there when the early Chuck Noll days. I was at the stadium and the Immaculate Reception oh, happened. Yeah. That kind of thing. Yeah, it was crazy time wow. when the Steelers were on there when the steel curtain was like alive and well, so yeah. to speak. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I've I've all, I've I like Pittsburgh. I mean, I don't are you much of a hockey fan or or never much of a Pens fan? Uh I was a little bit, not so much more basketball, more Steelers, more basketball. Okay. Yeah, not much of a hockey so, fan. So, like a 76ers fan or just basketball in general? No, Lakers. You know, even from the time I was a little kid, I was a Lakers fan, even okay. on the East Coast. Yeah. Well, so I'm, you I'm had to be at that time. There. Ever since they got Kareem, I've been a Lakers fan. So, that kind of <laughs> that tells you how long ago I was a Lakers fan when I was a kid. I mean, that that guy would make anybody a fan, though. But, you know, you kind of, you, you had – I feel like especially at that time, like you knew – you knew every year basically it was going to come down to the Lakers and the Celtics, so you might as well pick one of those two. All the time, right? For years and years and years. Yeah. Unless you want to just end up disappointed at the end of the of the season, like everybody else. Yeah. So. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> getting away from sports a little bit, I guess I didn't. You know, I didn't know that you grew up in Pennsylvania. So it kind of makes me even more interested in, I guess, your backstory as to kind of how you got into. Um, doing what you you know do and what what you did for so long i um i went to school in edinburgh and i majored in design i majored in art at edinburgh because it was a great art school and i went back to pittsburgh and my father wanted me to be a teacher and i like tried that suit on for like five minutes and i went well that's never gonna happen i'm never doing this for a living and so I got, um, I had been a, I had been a scenic artist. I'd been a, what they call a scenic artist back in the East coast. I painted backdrops for different theater companies and operas and things like that. And so I just decided that I wanted to go to grad school and I needed to get some more education. And so I got an offer to go to, for a graduate assistantship at San Diego state. And I took about 10 months after Edinburgh off, and then I went back to school, and I went back and did my master's, and so I moved to California. I didn't know a soul. I moved out here on a one-way plane ticket with a duffel bag and a portfolio and planted my ass down in San Diego and started doing my master's degree, and uh, it all just sort of sprouted from there. I started doing some theater up in Central California one summer, and a guy that I met up there told me that he was working in Hollywood, and he thought that I had the talents. And I moved to L.A. in 80, 
for August of 84. I slept on a couch for six months because I couldn't afford to live anywhere and uh, got myself an apartment and started working. And it's been 30, I don't know now, 39 years or something like that. I'm in freelancing. Wow. So a long time. What kind of jobs were you getting when you first went out there? Uh, when I first started in LA, the very first thing I got was a guy. It's so funny. A guy, I, a friend of mine turned me on to a guy who had a job opening and I said, you know, do you want to do this? And I said, sure. And he was doing a show for the Lido nightclub in Paris. He was a variety show designer. And he looked at me when I went to meet him and he said, um, can you draft in metric? And I looked him right in the eye and I said, oh yeah, of course I can. Well, <laughs> I didn't have a I didn't have a clue. I never drafted in metric in my life. So I went to the hardware store, you know, because it was before like phones and all that kind of shit, right? So I have a tape measure that I bought that had English on one edge and metric on the other edge. And so he would tell me how big something was. And then he would like go out of his office, go get a cup of coffee or something. And underneath the drafting table, I'd pull out the tape measure. <laughs> I'd go, 47 feet. Okay, that's blah, 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 centimeters. Write that down. And that's the way I drew the whole thing. It was just literally, I had no clue what I was doing. I mean, I had a rough idea. Wow. And uh, so I worked for that dude for about three weeks. And then I got a call from the people at General Hospital, the soap opera. And they were doing, they have, in the soap operas back then, they used to do overhires. And they would go on adventures. And Luke and Laura from General Hospital went to, did a Mexican adventure. And they hired me as an additional draft person because they were doing so many new sets. And I got in the union through General Hospital. I did my 30 days and got a union card right out of the gate. I was so blessed. I mean, to get a union card three months into L being in L.A. is almost impossible. And somebody wanted me to do this for a living. And I got in and started working. I did general hospital for like five months and they laid me off. And then I went to Santa Barbara, the soap opera for about six months. And then they laid off there and I've just been doing stuff ever since. So I don't know much about soap operas. I've never really watched many of them, but the one thing that I do know, and it may be a cliche is that at the time they were really fucking popular. Like people loved soap operas. Oh, yeah. My mom, when I'd come home from school, my mom, when I was a little boy, my mom would be at the ironing board doing my dad's shirts and she'd have the soap operas on. And I was like, I don't know, nine years old. And I would come sit on the couch and my mom would be ironing her clothes and waiting for my dad to come home. And she'd be making sure that she got her fix every day. I mean, it was like a religion for her. For yeah. And I feel and I, a lot of women, yeah, a lot of women for years and years and years. Well, even still, like I used to work at the uh, CBS affiliate in Rochester, and a uh -huh. uh, woman, it, you know, and I worked there during the whole pandemic and everything. So there were a lot of special reports. So sometimes Young and the Restless would not air at its appropriate time, and this woman would call into the station every day and be like. Listen, I know you've got the storylines there. Like, just tell me what happens in, 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 in Young and the Restless today. Yeah. I don't care right. about what's going on with the world health. I want to know what happens in the Young and the Restless. Right. Oh, the president's getting impeached? Um, mm. Yeah. We don't care. Yeah. In the old days, I remember my mother would sit on the phone talking to her girlfriend, you know, before her cell phones or anything. And she'd be on, after they'd end, she'd be on the phone. Can you believe what happened to Laura today? <laughs> you know, all that. It was like almost their Kardashians for that generation, only in a different, you know, but it was just more fictionalized as opposed to being, you know, being yeah. real. So when you're when you're young and you're out there and you start working on these soap operas and it's kind of your introduction into all of this, you, is it even on your mind as to like what's next or are you kind of thinking, you know, oh, like I can I can do soap operas. And the reason I ask that is because a lot of things now, you know, there's definitely crossover between industries, but once you're in a specific role, like be it marketing or sales or something like that, it seems like that's kind of the path you stay on. So once you, you know, started in soap operas, was it kind of like, okay, now I want to work my way into, you know, different sitcoms or were you not even thinking that at the time? More than anything else, you know, I was, whatever, I was 21 years old. I was just worried about eating and finding a place to sleep, right? More than yeah. anything else. They were like the two biggies. And then I, um, but I worked for a guy. In fact, the guy who told me to come down here, who kind of gave me some, um, some phone numbers to call people to meet, things like that. 
he said to me, he said, when you're assisting, he said, try everything so that by the time you get to being a designer on your own, you'll have a much better idea of where, which direction you want to go. When I was a kid in town, then you could turn around and work in all different genres. So nobody pigeonholed you like they do now. Gotcha. So when I first started out, I did soap operas and I did talk shows and I did variety shows. I did some theme park work. Uh, I did all sorts of things so that I could know by the time I finished assisting, okay, I like that the best. And then I could go down that road. So that's kind of the way that I, you know, that's the way I approached it. So when I was assisting, people would call and say, you know, do you want to drive on a theme park? And I'd be like, sure, I'll draw, you know, it was just about me. You know, like I said, it was really about making money and earning a living. You know? yeah. And you kind of went, okay, how can I make that and, you know, keep myself somewhat interested. But when I came to Holly, you know, people say, well, I came to win an Oscar or I came to win an Emmy or I came to do this or that. And I didn't have any of those aspirations. I didn't know what I was getting into, to be honest with you. I just turned around and knew that I was supposed to, you know, my father told me that I needed to get a job and go to work. I just happened to go to work in Hollywood and get into this world, you know, but I mean, it was the same kind of philosophy, but I had no understanding of it. I had no delusion. I didn't know what an Emmy award was probably when I started out, you know? So it was a lot of people come here saying, I want to be a star. Or I want to be this, or I want to be that. I just wanted to work, you know, yeah. I just liked what I did and I wanted to work and I wanted to get, you know, and I just kept at it. So there wasn't any real like major thing, you know, there wasn't like that motivation of any particular kind. Yeah. Just food just, and shelter. Yeah, yeah. I mean, pretty much. Right. It was just sort of like everybody else. You get out of college and go, shit, I need some place to sleep and I need something to eat. So I got to do something. I mean, the greatest thing in the world is that I'm doing something pretty much that I love. So it makes it that much easier, you know, because yep. um, it's not an easy easy business. I mean, I've been freelancing for 39 years, so it's, you know, and again, I'm, I'm out of work in another three weeks. And then I start looking all over again for the next new thing. You know, I just did a, um, you guys, uh, you know, Haley, you know, Justin Bieber's wife, Haley. I do. Yeah. So I just did a show called, I just designed a set for a thing called who's in my bathroom. Have you seen this thing on YouTube? I have not. All right. So write that, <laughs> write that down on your notes, boys. There's like you got to check out on YouTube. Haley Bieber's Who's in My Bath. I don't know if I feel comfortable Googling who's in my bathroom, yeah. Jerry. But if you say so, I'll just. Well, if you don't feel comfortable, imagine how I felt. I'm going, she's like 24 years old. And I'm like, oh, what kind of show is this? But um, it's a reality show that she's created. And she has her friends. They did. Um, there's about four or five of them on YouTube and they did them a couple of them at her house. And then they went to a hotel and they did a couple. And then a company that I just worked for decided to do it to series. So they build a set and put it on a soundstage. And so now they're trying to sell the thing and get it out there because she has her own, she's got a product line coming out and she's got her own YouTube channel. And so I think she's like the first guest on the thing was um, Kendall Jenner. So Haley knows everybody. She's got yeah. 800,000 followers on yeah. Instagram. So yeah. she's just pulling her friends in and doing this. But like when Kendall Jenner was in, you know, they brought a hot plate in and they made macaroni and cheese. <laughs> the stars they, are just like us. Yep. They literally, literally sat there and they talk about shit. It's the funniest thing in the world. I said, I wanted to meet the salesman because whoever sold that show to somebody who's in my bathroom and that's like what you're going to do a series on. I went, that person's a genius salesperson well, beyond the chat. Yeah. And you know what? I guarantee you my girlfriend will watch that show without a doubt. And a lot totally. of people that I know as somebody, you know, I, Justin Bieber was the most popular person probably on earth when we were like in high school. So everybody that I've ever met, specifically females still to this day, loves Justin Bieber. Yeah. It's the, that whole thing is so, you know, it's like, I can't remember what they were talking about. Haley had like 800,000 followers. Kendall was like 3.5. Yeah. I don't remember what Justin was, but they were talking to me and they said, well, I mean, you have an audience right there for a TV show. Yeah. If you could get 4 million people to watch that thing, Jesus, that thing will go on for five years, you know? Yeah. And, and how different is that from 
you know, the, some of the earlier TV shows you did. Oh, it's way different. I mean, it's, you know, it's, um, I mean, the stuff, it really is what she's done is she's doing a talk show basically in her yeah. bathroom. I mean, that's kind of what she did, you know? So she just sort of took another take on doing a talk show and for her generation and whatnot. So they, you know, they hang out and they talk about all kinds of stuff and whatnot, but it's not, you know, it's extemporaneously scripted. Yeah. You know what I mean? They sort of kind of have an idea what they're going to talk about, but not really. And they just sort of riffed for 20 minutes. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it's way different than things that I, st- I mean, in the beginning, everything was very regimented and very scripted. And at that point in my career, probably, I don't think any 23 year old ever had that kind of, you know, would have that kind of a show ever, Yeah. you know, right. It was way hard harder to you know the fact that she can i was kind of busting the producer because we were talking in the beginning about a budget and he was giving me a hard time about money and i said to him i said fuck i said can't justin just write a check yeah seriously <laughs> and he just like i mean i'm talking not talking about like his weekly check i'm talking like a day check that he could like write to produce a show yeah <laughs> yeah i said out of love come on justin the money we don't have the money for this. And I went, well, fuck, Justin's got the money yeah. for it. Won't he put up a quarter of a mil for his wife? You exactly. Know? If he really loved his wife, he would have, you know, he would have done it. Yeah. Right. And you think about like if a quarter of a mil to him is like 20 bucks to you. Yeah. So what the hell, you yeah. know? Yeah. 20 bucks is a lot, goes a long way in my lifestyle. So, yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. I am only 23. So there you go. I fit right in. Right. There you go. Me and Haley Bieber. We're, we're one in the same. <laughs> I wanted to ask you a little about a little bit about um, your work on Fuller House because I was reading on your website that um, you know you you get the job and obviously it's uh, 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 kind of this this revamp it's a recreation of a super iconic set so maybe you're going into that or somebody's telling you this is going to be so easy. Like there's, you know, this, this set is already designed, but it's that, um, I was surprised to hear that that actually, uh, things were a little more difficult than one would think they'd be. Well, I, I went to the guys that produced that I had worked for before Bob Boyette. I had just done a thing called partners that was done for FX for a while. That was a Kelsey Grammer, Martin Lawrence, 10 episode run. And the other guy, Jeff Franklin, and I had done a thing called Head Over Heels back in the 90s for. And so I knew both these guys. So I did an interview. I just went and met them. And they said, hey, this is what you're, you know, we want you to do this. Take it. You know, we want you to take this. So when you get opportunities like that, you don't turn them down. You know, you just say, of course, I'll do it. And the guy said to me this one, Frank, Jeff Franklin, who is the younger of the producers, he said to me, he said, you know, he goes, I just want to tell you that this is the easiest gig that you're ever going to get, blah, 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 you know, because he said that the drawings existed from in the Warner Brothers archives. So I was like going, oh, I'm good, man. <laughs> you tell me that I got drawings already and then I just got to put it on a stage and get it rebuilt. Well, the problem is, is that we went in the archives and the drawings had been thrown away. They had not a record. The original designer I know is an old friend of mine, and I reached out to her, and I said, by any chance you have copies? He said, nope. I gave them all to Warner Brothers, and they got thrown away. So when we started, you know, like you said, it's an iconic set, and it's massive. The pilot called for the front porch, the living room, the kitchen, the basement, the attic, the two bedrooms, the upstairs hallway, and something else. And I had to create all that stuff from scratch. So what we, my assistant and I had to do was we probably watched, oh, I don't know, I bet you we watched 100 episodes of Full House. And we used to have to do screen grabs. So I'd be like watching a scene and I'd go, well, there's the kitchen table. So I'd do a screen grab. And then I'd have to find another shot where there's some little, where the baby was crawling around on the floor. And I go, oh, well, there's the baseboard. So let me match the baseboard. So take that picture and go to my, you know, my catalogs and see if I could find that molding. So that's the way we did Fuller House. It took us weeks of just watching footage and grabbing pictures. And then we took a whole wall and pasted up all these photographs of all these, like the little girl would reach for the handrail going up the stairs. 
And then you'd go, okay, well, there's the spindle, there's the handrail, there's, or we had to draw what was built from scratch. We'd have to draw just from proportioning. And I had guessed, and I started and I went, okay, well, it looks like the stairs are four feet wide. And I think that's this big. And so I had to draw the whole thing and then try to throw it on a stage and then go, oh, <laughs> And the problem was, is that the original stage that they built it on compared to where we were was 24 feet wider than what I had to work with. So not only did I have to copy all this shit, but I had to cut 24 feet out of it. But when you start talking about 20, 24 feet is a lot of room, you know, to get rid of things. And so I'd have to go to like the kitchen and get rid of a foot. And then I'd have to go to the bedroom and get rid of 18 inches. And then I'd have to take a little out of the hallway and that's how I fit the whole thing in was basically doing it like that while still so making it oh while still making it look the, the, the same. same proportionally. Yeah. Holy shit. You know, what was so cool is that we did the walk and needless to say, I was nervous when we did the walkthrough because you've got, you know, an audience of the world that knows this stuff. And then the cast was coming in. And so Saget and Bob and uh, Stamos and Kouye came in and I know David from socially. And they're like looking around and nobody's saying anything. And I'm like, oh, shit, nobody's saying anything. What's, you know, what's wrong? And I looked over and um, one of the actresses was crying. And I was like, what's wrong? And she's like, oh, my God. She said, nothing's wrong. This is tripping me out because you took me right down to her childhood. You know, because Jody was like five when she started the series. And I met Jody when she was like in her 30s, you know, and it was like, wow, it was pretty weird to have that experience. And when we did the first episode of Fuller House, we, you know, like when you go to a play, how they have a main curtain and that, that goes up at the beginning of the play, right? And the curtain goes up. Well, we rigged a curtain on our soundstage, which we don't do on sitcoms very often, but we put a curtain up and we pulled the curtain up and we had a studio audience of about 200, a little over 200 people. They got a standing ovation. People were screaming and crying. And I didn't because I'm older. Like I wasn't really like a Fuller House guy. You know what I mean? That was kind of like past my viewing age group, I guess, at the time. So I didn't really know how married these people were to that show. And I'm talking to friends of mine and they're going, I came from a divorced family and this was my family on Friday nights. And I was tripping out. I was going, really? Like, this meant that much to so many people, you know? And it continued that way forever. I mean, it, it's amazing how big that audience is and how loyal. And you'd get emails saying, well, I saw in that door and you had the door in the wrong place. I'd be like, fuck me. I just watched 100 <laughs> hours worth of television. And I still couldn't, you know? It's still because, you know, when they shoot sitcoms, right, it's all shot, you know, it's all headshots. Mm -hmm. So there's no like big, pretty, oh, look at the living room kind of thing. So it was all just tiny, tiny little pieces. It was a lot of work. That was a hard, that was a hard thing to pull together. But when the cast came in and they started crying, I was like, oh, well, I guess I'm good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that well, little walked. pat on the back, little pat on the back. Like, not, not a I'm big not deal. pushing the issue. I'm not asking any questions. Everybody's crying. Everybody's happy to see you later. Yep. yep. <laughs> That's so crazy. That's just such a different experience. You know, if, if like Matthew or I, who, who grew up watching that show, had been in a position like that. That's just, I mean, that's just so crazy. Because obviously you're there. You're just hoping you did your job right, you know. Totally. And, and we would, and we would have been adding so much of the nostalgia in into that. But man, the fact that they threw away the the designs for that is mind blowing. Like, well, you know, it's like anything else, right? It's. I like guess it was... so, but it it just it it just reminds me of like, like something you hear about how. Like the the old Johnny Carson tapes, they would like you know reuse that film and stuff. So those shows and I, things are like lost forever. Record over shit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's I it's feel just storage. You know, it's just like anything else, right? It's like you got so much shit in your house, and you get a storage unit, and then you fill that up, and you go, oh well, that's full. So I got to make a decision of what to get rid of and what not. You know, yeah. and they are drawing like there used to be. The art departments and studios were different then than they are now. Back in those days, they had a big giant drafting room with all set design, what they call set designers, who are the people that do the drafting. And it was a big giant room. And these guys in the 30s and 40s wore sport jackets and ties. And they're at the drafting table fully dressed. 
and doing all these drawings. And so they had drawings from the twenties at Warner brothers from all the old movies. Like they kept every single drawing because you didn't work on a show. Then you worked on staff. So like today I'd come in and say, you know what? You're working on Fuller house oh, today. Got it. And you know what? You're going to work on Camelot because we're shooting that movie across the way and they need some help today. So you're going over there. So it was like a whole different way of working then. And yeah. I think they just had so much shit. They just couldn't, they couldn't store it. Yeah. You know, and it was too much even then, you know, now you might try to scan those drawings. You know what I mean? You might have that capability, but when they were tearing the studio apart and doing all the remodeling, they didn't have that kind of stuff at their fingertips and the amount of, I can't imagine how many years it would take you to scan those drawings. I mean, it would be a full-time job for somebody for, years and years and years standing at a at a scanner just running them through you know man so I think that, yeah that's like working for amazon yeah <laughs> yeah Shout right it's the same kind of quantity of stuff and yeah you go, well yeah what do you do you know like even now i don't keep you know and now we work on a computer so we keep things more just because they're a computer but i have years and years and years of pencil drawings and models and stuff like that that i've just thrown away right you got nowhere to put them yeah. They're not worth it, you know. They're not worth anything at this point. And every somebody said to me one time, they said, "We want to see your, you know, your portfolio." I said, "Go to YouTube. <laughs> all you have to do is type in Jerry Dunn and YouTube, and there's like, you know, 700 episodes of all kinds of shit on there." Yeah, that's a baller move, man. Yeah. That's a big. Yeah, like, I'm gonna start saying that to people. That's a Our big... shows, I do. Yeah, yeah, just go to YouTube. That's a that's a pretty heavy mic drop. <laughs> Well, and, you think about it, right? I did like 700 episodes of Disney Channel shows. Oh, yeah. I did a, I did a hundred and something Fuller Houses. I did a hundred and some Anger Managements. You know, the Connors now were on, I don't know where we're at the Connors. You know, we're four years or four and a half years into the Connors. Yeah. yeah. And everything goes there anymore. So it's just kind of like, well, if you really want to see my work, go to you. Uh, yeah. yeah. What is the, what on the Connors real quick. So what, uh, What's the big difference? I the biggest difference, I guess, between recreating the set of full an iconic set for Fuller House as opposed to recreating an iconic set for the Connors when you were actually a part of originally designing that set for Roseanne. Yeah, I didn't do. They hired another design when they restarted the series, the Roseanne thing that she got fired off of. I didn't do that. I didn't do that show in the first ten episodes. They hired another guy which didn't really like make me very happy, but they did. And because yeah. my yeah. boss that I did the, did Roseanne with, he had retired. So he was out of the picture. Right. And so they hired another guy. So he did, he did the recreation, but he's a friend of mine and he used to call me and ask me, send me the drawings and say, well, you'd look so, cause I drew the original set. And so I can talk to him about proportions and de details and all that kind of stuff. And then, so when I took the, when I got into the Connors, I actually worked for another designer for two years as an assistant. And then I just took over the Connors this season for the first time. Oh, wow. So that must, how did that feel? Shitty. Oh, man. <laughs> I really was hoping, you know, I was like the original guy and I yeah. was really kind of hoping that I'd get to do it. But the funny thing is, is now after all this, I'm back doing what I wanted to do in the beginning which yeah. was to design, be the production designer on the thing. The thing that I love about the con, like when we did the Roseanne set, when we first did that, you know, television then was really what they would call aspirational. So they wanted everybody like the friend's apartment, right? Everybody knows that nobody could afford to live in that apartment in New York, right? Yes. But that's what people aspired to. So everything in television was all about heightened reality in the 80s, and they wanted you to aspire to have a better life or have a better home or whatever. And so that's why television was designed. And then when Roseanne came along, they decided to get real. And she was the first one that was really like that they should, that America could relate to. You know, her ratings were never great from in California and New York State. They didn't do great in numbers. But if you look at the numbers on Roseanne from the New York border to the California border, her audience is massive because it's all the people, you know, it's like, you know these people yeah. that live in Buffalo and you go, you know, a lot of people don't have shit. They don't have money. They don't have any of this kind of stuff. And Roseanne was the first 
was one to put it out there in a way that people could relate to. And I think that's why she was so loved. I think that's why people liked her so much. Oh, 100%. She was just, yeah, I think a lot of people right? don't realize that she had that kind of impact. Um, well, because I think because she's, I mean, I never was never a fan. Yeah. You know what I mean? Of her as a person. So I think that took part of it away from it. If she had been a little more humble, not so outrageous. <laughs> probably, sure. Well, the, the truth of the matter is she'd still be doing a show now after four more years like Connor. She'd still be working on it. And yeah. she probably would have a much bigger following now if she had been able to just kind of like keep her mouth shut and, you know, <laughs> yeah, do her thing. Yeah. Which can be the well, case in a lot of times now. I have a, a – you mentioned friends and I wanted oh, to bring geez. up the friends set um, because we're notoriously an anti friends podcast on the show. Uh, I don't know <laughs> if you knew that. Yeah. So uh, yeah. Um, and not because of the show itself, mostly because of the, it's following, but I guess I never really thought about how iconic that set was. So when you're kind of working around that at the time, is there a lot of, you know, like, okay, well we need to, create something that's like the front set that right. people Was know there a lot of pushback remember. trying to design well, people do people say that shit all the time mm -hmm. you know it's like they're like well we want it to look like such and such well as a designer i don't want to make it look like friends you know what i mean i want to make my own yeah iconic. you want it to look like how you want it to look and so i think a lot of it you know that people what they do is they go well friends was a hit show so that must mean that that designer is a hit designer. And so that's how that kind of stuff, you know, carries on. You know, well, it didn't really have anything to do with the designer. They just happened to design something that was interesting. At the yeah. Time, you know, but um, no, Friends was, I was never a big fan. And I, the sets were, they were fine. You know, they were fine. <laughs> join they, the movement. <laughs> I mean, I said, join the movement. Yeah, it became a massive thing, you know, and it just grew and grew and grew. Like, it's so funny because they said nobody really, but when you think about the Roseanne, nobody wants their living room to look like hers. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? It's like nobody wants a threadbare plaid couch with an old Afghan hanging over the back and shitty carpet all over the floor. They'd want it to be, you know, New York City or whatever. Sure. But um, but that's what a lot of people have. You know, right. and that's, it's, it's totally what they have, yeah. right? It's like that's the, I grew up, you know, the town I grew up in is 14,000 people. You know, it's a little town, and Jesus, more than half of them were lower middle class for sure. And so I felt too, when I started working on it, I felt like even now in the Connors, this is my, you know, I just did a dive bar last week on the show. Well, I'd been in that dive bar a hundred times in my life. <laughs> and so it's easy to create coming from your world. You know what I mean? When you're so accustomed to what all this stuff is, it's, you know, it's fun to design. It's fun to recreate things that are, you know, like that. So, when, when you're in different situations now, do you catch yourself and probably have for a while, do you catch yourself like, Hmm, like this would be a really good set piece for like a specific show? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, yes, sometimes, yes. Sometimes you find things that you go, you know what, this is, and a lot of times you get inspired with things. You know, you'll start working on something and you're kind of trying to figure it out, but you haven't really landed. But then you'll go somewhere, you'll be someplace, and you'll see a thing. And then I go, that's, that's like, that's a takeoff point for me that I could turn around and go, okay, now I can take that thing and turn that into a whole set. So sometimes it's a little, um, you get inspired, you know, you're like trying to draw and you're going, fuck, I'm not like liking it and I'm not feeling it. And then all of a sudden it just sort of clicks and then it goes. That's got to become very stressful, though, at times, I imagine, when you have, you know, somebody walks in to you and, and gives you like a, a very quick description of what they need. And then you have just like a couple hours to write something up so that they can get the set going because they need it in like two days or whatever. Yeah. We've been, <laughs> my assistant Bargaby and I have been having that experience all spring on the Connors because the scripts have been late and I don't get scripts to design from at all. And sometimes I don't even get information until late Tuesday or Wednesday afternoon. And we turn the stage around. What we mean turn around is we tear down all these sets from one particular episode and put them up for the next. So a lot of times in the last six, three months, I've not had anything to work from. And it's all been like that. 
It's like, oh, we need a funeral home. We need a house. We need a rooftop. We need a bar or whatever. And I'm doing this kind of, we're doing this kind of work in like six to eight hours, which is faster than anything I've ever done. It's crazy. But when you're tuned into the show, do you know what I mean? I'm not worried about the look of the set. I just have to get it done. Yeah. That makes it that much easier. If I was trying to do like a Victorian mansion from scratch, I'd be like, fuck, this is like, you know, this is like a lot of thought and a lot of work. Mm -hmm. When you're doing white trash or middle, lower middle class, <laughs> it's a little bit easier. It's a little bit easier to do that kind of stuff because the detailing's not as fine. It's not as specific, you know, it's more impression than anything else. Yeah. Like we did um, tonight's episode. There's a, um, there's a street exterior that we threw together in like a day. And then there's a cemetery that we put together. So check it out. If you get a chance tonight, it's on nine o'clock on the Connors and check out what we did this week. For sure. Huh. Um, I didn't want to, I know you were on the Connors, so I didn't want to move off of yet, but I did want to talk about the Disney channel stuff. Yeah, we have to, I mean, you worked on shows that us and our audience, I mean, that was like, that was our childhood, man. And you know, with you working on, I messaged you this about Hannah Montana specifically because I think that that show, for one thing, I I don't necessarily I think that um, the the design on that show was particularly important for her character because of um, the dual life that she played. Her room had to be. Her room is what solidified that to like us as children as an audience because she had that like secret closet part or whatever, you know. <laughs> yes, the secret closet with the with the uh, turn with the with, spinning yeah, clothes yeah, rack yeah. and all that. Uh, yeah, that was yeah, it was supposed to be like that was her fantasy life. So it was like she'd walk out of her bedroom and then walk through this little thing and then show up and it'd be like, well, there's Anna Montana. Full, you know all the wigs and all the outfits and the whole thing yeah, yeah that was um i said to somebody i said i've never in my career been more popular <laughs> well she when had I the best hannah, of both worlds <laughs> when i did hannah montana I, I used to turn around and i would get i mean it got to a point where i couldn't answer the phone anymore wow i was getting so many ticket requests from because my had at the time i was married and had stepdaughters who were teenagers well hell they everybody you know they, all they do is tell them that their stepdad did hannah and everybody and their mother wanted to come to taping and they had a hard time. We had an audience. It was big. It was like for a sitcom, it was like close to 245 people. And that thing was packed every single week. And if we had, they gave those tickets away. But if you had sold tickets to that show, you would have made an absolute mint just selling tickets. Show might still be on. I yeah. don't know. I don't know if she'd be down for yeah. it anymore. Who knows? Who knows the matter these days? Um, and The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody, too. That was a show that I watched religiously as a child. Well, it, was more of, it was more of a guy show. Yeah. Yeah. That right? was, Hannah was more for the girls, and the Sweet well, Life. I mean, Sweet Life had a couple of cute girls, but it was really more about the twins. Yeah. And the boys. Yeah. I will say, I think Hannah Montana, though, was the show that you would like, you would secretly. Watch, watch religiously yeah, yeah. <laughs> like when well, we were kids. we'd watch it and we'd be like no we didn't watch no, it. in montana yeah. meanwhile we're blasting that yeah. cd in, in the room well the girls were <laughs> the girls were cute right there was emily there was hannah and yeah. all of her you know she's bringing in her friends all the time and whatnot for sure yeah it makes total sense but those shows i mean they the the look of those shows i feel like defined the the look of the Disney Channel as a whole for almost a decade after that, I think even because Hannah Montana was 2006 and The Sweet Life was what the year before. And yeah. um, if even if you go all the way to the um, the Zendaya show, Shake It Up, which was in like 2013 or 11 or something. I mean, you can you can see the roots like you like you can trace that back, I think, directly to those mid to early 2000 shows we always talk friends of mine like i have a lot of friends of mine who are you know seasoned writers who had worked on those shows and whatever and we talk about all the time that those were the great those are the glory days of the disney channel oh yeah in montana that's so raven when that was on for a long time sweet life you know i, th I think those and i think that after that they started to go downhill 
I don't think the shows were near as good as those shows were. It, you know, uh, it was kind of like what we were just talking about with Friends, where I think a lot of people just got involved. They were like, well, let's just kind of, uh, you know, take this part and what you get in that ultimately is just a watered down version of the well, thing that people actually really enjoy. And all they were trying to do is just hit, you know, whatever that expression is about hitting magic twice in a row. You know what I mean? They were always trying yeah. to like, they were all just waiting for another set of twins to show up. Yeah. Kept waiting for another Miley Cyrus yeah. to pop in. Billy Ray know? to have another kid. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, and remember when, who was, what was it? Um, I didn't do any of those. It was, um, what was the one with, um, oh, I can't think of her name. Oh, sorry, it's not Selena Gomez. It's the other one. Demi, one Lovato. Demi Lovato. Oh, Demi Lovato. Yeah. Remember, they she did a show, and then that was kind of a mess. Yeah, yeah. Sunny yeah. with a chance. Sunny with a chance. Sunny yep. A and chance. then right. they they like pivoted that show into the show that that show revolved around. Like that was yeah that that was that was a really weird one. I have a, I think, a yeah. Go oh, go ahead. I think that that's when it started to get weird. They were doing too many shows. They didn't have enough experience. People running all these shows. And I think that's when they, you know, they were just waiting, right? Yeah. They were waiting for another Miley. They were waiting for another Selena Gomez and they couldn't find her. And they kept trying and trying. And, you know, I mean, everybody and their mother, even Nickelodeon did several pilots in that time trying to find their own Miley. You know, that's all they yeah. wanted because it was just, it's just money. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's really all they're concerned about is how much money can we make, but they couldn't find that lightning in a bottle. They still haven't found it. I know they're still struggling. They were, when I was there, I think they were the top, they were the number one children's programming network at the time. And I think now in the kids' world, they're like 17th or something like that. I mean, wow. they've really taken a big, big fall. Yeah, Coco Melon. Coco Melon, what's that? Isn't that that kid show on Netflix that like every kid from the age of like three to six absolutely loves because they change it's it's like a animated show but i'm pretty sure oh. it's the most popular show for kids on netflix well it's a thing there's so many different there's a lot more outlets now with streaming like yeah. every totally. everything streaming you know so yep. it, that's a big part of it but and you have a lot of the streamers you know throwing more money at it than yeah disney would yeah you know nickelodeon, Especially now. nickelodeon and disney channel are owned by big corporations but they're all segmented so they don't spend money, but yet, you know, you go to Amazon and Apple and Netflix, and if they want something to be good, well, they'll throw whatever they have to throw at it to make that happen. Yeah. And they don't, they don't do that at Nickelodeon. They don't do that at the Disney Channel. Um, it's, not, it's not their MO. Yeah. I've, did you do all of the Sweet Life, Sweet Life of Zack and Cody? Did you work on that show the whole time or most yeah, of it? Yeah, I did all the seven. I did all the Sweet Life of Zack and Cody's and Sweet Life on Dex. So – there's one episode from Sweet Life and Zack and Cody that I refer to almost daily in my life, and I will never forget it. And it's the ghost episode. It's the Halloween episode where Esteban does the ghosty speak to us. Oh, and right. I, that room, the room that they, that haunted room in the hotel, haunted me for years as a child. <laughs> like it's, it petrified me. I have, I have a vivid memory of that room. So to know that. You know, you had part in creating that room is probably the coolest thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> it was fun. You know, that was the great thing about those. You know, we got to do Halloween all the time. Oh, yeah. You know, we got to do big extravaganzas a lot, which was fun. And those I love the... doing Sweet Life of Zach. The Sweet Life on Deck, I love doing that show. Between the cruise ship itself and then being able to tour when we used to go around the world. We went to London and we went to ireland and we went to thailand and you know we went all over the place on that show and for a designer that was a blast getting a chance to do stuff you know international locations because you don't even do that kind of stuff on sitcoms really yeah you know that was kind of like a very unique animal in itself yeah yeah i suppose with kids kids shows in general you you really get to expend a lot more creativity i imagine just because a big a big part of um a big part of, uh, I think, what, at least when we were growing up, a lot of places want was uh, just so many colors. Like, you really get to go wild and uh, make things look uh, a little bit funky. You know, you really get to right. stretch your legs creatively in that space. Well, and that was, they, you know, they wanted that. You know what I mean? That was a dictum from the company about that kind of thing. 
And so you really had to, and it was interesting because I had come out of the network for years. And so all of a sudden you go there and in the network in the late eighties, early nineties, they were very conservative. You know, things were beige and things were kind of plain and you didn't really get into a lot of character. And then all of a sudden you go to the Disney channel and they're like, yeehaw, do, you know, do all this. And you couldn't put enough color in it. And so for me, it was great practice because I remember in the very beginning, I looked at a couple of That's So Raven sets, I don't know, several months ago. And I was like, boy, that shit's ugly. <laughs> and it was really, and it was really because I was just getting my feet wet as to how to do that kind of thing, you know? People are like, oh, just paint it a color. Well, it's just not that simple for one thing. And what looks good versus what's obnoxious in color is really a fine line a lot of times. So I learned so much. And we didn't, a lot of those shows were done really low budget. So I ended up using a lot of theater techniques that I did when I was in grad school and whatnot because they didn't have the money to spend. And so you'd be, you know, how do I do a forest or how to do something? How do I do things that was always cheap? Just do, you know, how cheap can you do it? How cheap can you do yeah. it? And right. that was just sort of the, you know, the, so a lot of times you would mm -hmm. skip detail, like architectural detail and sets because you didn't have the money, but you'd paint them bigger colors. Yeah because that kind of made up for what wasn't there. Like, oh, interesting. I remember the the other, like, specific place that there was always scenes happening at in Hannah, Montana, was that, like, beach set where they had, like, the beach bar, and there was just... I, that is a specific memory in my mind. I don't even really like warm weather. I, I prefer to live somewhere in, like, a moderate climate, but that was a place where I was always like, I would love to just hang out there with my friends. <laughs> that was a big stretch. That was a big, you know, a lot of these... It's so funny... You know, it's like that set. Nobody had done exterior beaches on stages before. Yeah. So those were big step outs. You know what I mean? To try to do that kind of stuff. The hotel on Sweet Life. You know, you know, the boat that we did for Sweet Life on deck, they hadn't done a cruise ship on stage since Love Boat. Whoa. And when was a Love Boat done? Like in the... 60s or something yeah like that, 60s maybe into, into the early 70s yeah right? but nobody had ever done that kind of a scale i mean that boat was 40 feet high 70 feet wide and 40 feet deep that boat was massive and um so people don't really realize how iconic some of that stuff was you know it's like if you look at the hotel on the sweet life of zach and cody that hotel lobby was massive and all the gags and all the stuff that you used to see in that lobby for a, for a sitcom set, that thing was, you know, two or three times as big as a normal house. And that was really kind of the boys' living room. So the stuff that we got to do then, you know, the Hannah Montana Pier. Remember when she moved that we did the final season and she moved to the house in the canyons with the horses? Yeah. And we did the pier set. Yeah, we were doing stuff that nobody would even. I mean, the, God bless the Disney Channel for being <laughs> so bold to try that kind of stuff, you know? Yeah. And every single one of them, I'd sweat bullets right till the last minute with them, you know, because you went, for one thing, I'm doing something that nobody's done before. And then you're trying to please a client who doesn't really have a clue what you're trying to do. <laughs> it would look, you know, they look at Mo Santa Monica Beach and they go, well, it's supposed to look like that. And I'm like, well, <laughs> it's a set. Yeah, <laughs> man. It's like, you know, let's not get crazy here. We're not out on the ocean with a pier. You know, we're doing a set on a soundstage. But, um, yeah, that was the cool thing that was cool about it. We got to do a lot of iconic things that will be remembered for a long time. That's true. It, it, I mean, it says a lot about when networks, cable channels, whatever, are willing to take risks like that. You know, they. if you do things like that, you have to realize the audience is going to appreciate that. Whether they are super aware of it or not, that is going to come through in the work and people are going to be like oh i like this they might not oh, and, even know especially why and believe it you know what i mean it's like it was my yeah. job like when you were talking about the beach i gotta sell it as best i can with what i have you know <clears throat> and so you don't have any choice but to turn around and make it work yeah but it's pretty scary in the beginning of stepping out like that you know we probably had it was so funny the producers were all freaked out about the sand on that beach. Well, normally what we've done in, and I've done in other things is use beige carpet for sand. 
and you put beige carpet down and that gives you the base for the sand. And everybody kept saying to me, oh, you'll just like sprinkle the carpet with sand, which is what you usually do. Well, because we had kids running around in flip flops and rolling around on the ground and everything. I think the last season we were six or eight inches deep in sand, <laughs> 60 feet wide and 40 feet deep. Well, that was a, sh I mean, we were bringing in, yeah, we brought in tons of sand by the time we were finished doing that whole thing. That was probably easy to contain. Oh yeah. Real. And everybody <laughs> loved me. Yeah. As, you know, staying, when you go on vacation and you bring sand into the house, well, guess what happens to sand on a soundstage? It goes fucking everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and you'd just be standing there going, uh, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Get another broom, get another guy. I don't know what to tell you. Yeah, bring somebody else in. There's got to be an intern somewhere. Get him a broom. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. Give, him a, give him a broom and I'm going to sweep the floor for the hundredth time. Yeah. Today. <laughs> and you you mentioned, um, you know, working with different places and different places being willing to put more money into sets and, you know, whether it be movies or TV shows in general. How difficult is that in certain situations, especially once you have an idea in your head and they're like, yeah, but you can only spend this much money. And now you're like, all right, well, I'm not going to be able to exactly do what I thought I was going to do. Now I've got to make this work and still be content with it. Well, here's what I've learned, right? Is that in the beginning, I would try to design to your money. But when you start working from that place, you're working from a place of lack right out of the get, right out of the gate. I can't do, I can't afford, I can't do anything. So a lot of times what I'll do is I'll read a script and I'll start working, but it's not my really, because the budgets are given to me by an accountant through a producer. So somebody who really, for the most part, doesn't have a clue what, what things cost is telling me what something should cost. And so you go, I can't really worry about that in the beginning because what I have to do, if you two are the writers, executive producers, I have to make your script real on stage. That's my first job. And then somebody else has to figure out how to pay for it. Got it. So it's I can I can be as conscientious as I can be. But if you have delusions that you want a Boeing seven forty seven, but you have money for a Cessna, I'm like, <laughs> I don't know what the fuck to tell you. Yeah. I can't I can't make you know what I mean? I can't do what I can't do. So a lot of times what I'll do is just design things and then leave it to them. They yeah. go to the money. The money people and the creative producers and go here. This is what you wrote. This is what you approve. This is what I designed. And this is what it costs. Now, what do you want to do? Do you want to have less beach? Do you want to have less palm trees? Do you, you know, and I basically just sort of take it like that and go, okay, you can't afford that. You can't afford that, but we can do this. And then you try to make the money work as best you can around it. Yeah. But in the beginning, I would take all that on as my responsibility. And the last 10 years, I go, you know what? It's not my, I didn't write it. I didn't create it and I didn't put a budget to it, but yet you hired me to design it. So guess what? Now I'm bringing the real to you and you need to figure out whether or not it's worth it to you or not. It yeah. takes some of the owners out of it. Yeah. Cause in the beginning you get yourself fucking nut. You know, it's like you're saying, you go, Oh man, a piece of lumber cost a buck and I don't have a buck. So how do I figure out how to get a buck? And I'm like, I, I can't do that. Yeah. You know? We got to ask Justin Bieber yeah. for another yeah, you check. Yeah, Justin Bieber. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Got to hit up. Or got to hit up Billy Ray Cyrus. Yeah, have a little yeah. Bit of that. Can Billy Ray. That yeah, Billy Ray. Didn't you write money? that song about mullets? You got to have some royalties still coming in from that, right? Come on. You got some. You got some cash, bro. Come yeah. on. Oh, in here. Yeah. So it sounds like you know the the more you got into it, it turned into more of like an ask forgiveness than ask permission type scenario where it's like if you know. If you want this to look as good as you think it's going to be, this is what I came up with. If if it doesn't work, then you guys kind of have to find a way around it. Cause, uh, totally. Yeah. I make them make all the decisions to what they don't want or what they can't afford. Yeah. And a lot of times what they'll do is they'll, you know, they'll shuffle money around. Yep. And they'll go, okay, you know what? We can, because the way shows are allocated in budgets, like they have a movie or a music budget, a prop budget, you know, transportation budgets from all these different areas. So what you find is, is when you get into the nitty gritty, you don't need as much music money as you had in the budget. So you'll take five grand out of that and throw it towards a set. And so that's way they can move money around, kind of like you do with your checkbook. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you know what, I really want those rims. Well, you know what, I'm eating pizza for two weeks if I want those rims. 
So I'll eat pizza because I really, the rims mean that much to me. And I think that's the kind of decision that people make in show business too. You know, what's it worth to you? Right? Yeah. So when you're, when you're working on these different shows, when they're recording them, how much time are you actually spending on set? Are you there all almost all the time when they're doing no. it or? No, I'm gone. Gone? <laughs> no. I, we do, we do a week. We do um, Mondays. We have meetings or Mondays. And then Tuesdays and Wednesdays are actors rehearsals and whatnot. And then we do what they call run throughs at the end of Tuesday and Wednesday. So Tuesday afternoon is a run through with the, just the show producers, the people that write it. So we do a run through then, and then I get notes. And then on Wednesday, the network comes and then we do a met network run through. And that's really what the show is going to look like on air. And the network comes and then I may get some notes on Wednesdays after the network's through. And once they're done with their notes and they start shooting, what I'll do is go on stage. So if they're doing, you know, if we're doing a podcast room as a new set, I would come in and I would stand behind a camera and I would look at a monitor for five or 10 minutes, make sure that all the shots are covered. If I have any notes that I can do that I can get done in that time, I'll give them to my department heads to do some notes. And then I just walk away. So they spend hours and hours a day shooting like the living room on the Connors. Well, I don't have to be there for, you know, yeah. it's all uh -huh. set. It's all there. I don't have to do that kind of stuff. It's only on really special occasions that I get that I have to be on stage a lot. Gotcha. Because when we do multi-camera sitcoms, I used, I'm used to doing multiple shows a week. So I don't just do one. Like when I was doing the Disney Channel stuff, I was doing That's So Raven and Hannah and Sweet Life all at the same time the same weeks everything and so that's impossible to be on every stage yeah, all the later. time and they don't need you know I, I don't need to be there as long as my work's good and i know what mm -hmm. i want the thing to look like and it's meeting all the requirements of the script i don't really need to look at this point gotcha i mean i've been doing this a long time and i go okay i know the colors are fine i know the way it's laid out i'll just go check cameras to sort of make sure that they're not shooting anything that i don't like yeah and, and then I can go back and talk to the director if I don't think something's weird or I could turn around and make my notes or changes, whatever, as long as they're quick, that sort of thing. And how much of the camera aspect goes into it? Like, how much do you know beforehand what's going to be on camera and what's not going to be on camera? Uh, I have a pretty good idea of most of it. Gotcha. You know, every once in a while you get caught. Yep. But, but for the most part, I know. Gotcha. And it's like, even without a script, you know, you can come to me as a writer producer and say, Jerry, I want to do a set. I need a hardware store. Well, what I already know in the back of my mind is what that scene's going to kind of look like. Right. It's like, if I know that you're a key character owns the hardware store and you want a hardware store, I know that there's going to be some action at a counter with a cash register. I know there's got to be a door that you can shoot a front door that you can get access to. You know, and it's got to kind of like have X, Y, Z built into it. So I know a lot of times I can guess where they're going without words. And that just takes from being and doing it forever. Yeah. You know, some producers say, I don't have a script. And I go, you know, I don't really need a script. <laughs> just tell me kind of what happens and what you want it to look like. And I can fill in all the blanks. That's incredible. That's what comes with experience. Holy smokes. And I know that uh, you spent some time in China as well, right? Were you teaching over there? Yeah, I had a good buddy of mine. I loved, I went to Asia the first time. Um, I did the Miss Universe pageants for a couple of years. I traveled the world oh. for a couple of years. I did the Miss Universe pageant in Taiwan, in Bangkok, in LA, and in Vegas. Maybe there was one other. But I traveled, so I went to Taipei one time to do the Miss Universe pageant, and I fell in love with Asia. And then I got a chance to do a theme park. I got called by the Landmark Company, and I got a chance to go work on a theme park for a couple of weeks one time in Japan. And, uh, in fact, the director of Hannah Montana, a guy named Roger Christensen, in the beginning, he got a teaching job in China, in Shanghai, at a school called the Daytao Academy of Shanghai. And so they were putting together this whole consortium of experts from around the world in their different fields. And so I got invited to be part of that school. And so they had a program, you know, what you guys know of as an adjunct professor yep. in school, right? Don't have a full-time job or anything. Well, we were what they called masters. 
So they would have people from all over the world who were experts in their field and they would bring them in to teach like a week seminar kind of a thing. So I would go to Shanghai and I'd be in Shanghai for like nine days and I'd teach for like five. And then I'd turn around and then I'd run around for a couple of days when I wasn't working. <laughs> oh, wow. But it was great. I went to Shanghai one, two, three, four times, I think. In like three years, <laughs> I was in Shanghai four times. And I did a showroom for a giftware company in Hong Kong years ago. And I was in Hong Kong for, I don't know, like four or five times. One summer I was in Hong Kong. I love Asia. I have a, I have a great time in there. I find it fascinating. When you were teaching over there, what did uh, w was there was there anything that you mentioned that really seemed to get the students excited? Like what what did they seem most interested in learning about what you do? It was more about pop culture than anything else. They wanted to know about you know, and they want all the dirt. They want to know, <laughs> they want to know about you know behind the scenes of Friends, and they want to know all that kind of stuff. China is phenomenally friends crazy. We my buddy, go over. my buddy who went over there was a was an assistant director on Friends. Now he he only directed you know they did like a hundred and some episodes of that show. He only directed one of them, but he was the assistant director on it for like two or three years, and he would go to China. And they would do standing ovations when he would come out the lecture. <laughs> wow. That's how crazy the kids were in about friends, about the cultural phenomenon of friends. Oh, he wouldn't get the same reaction here. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, wild, though. It's so, I mean, I, it's, it seems to me like they have a real thirst for the culture. It's like, uh, it's like when basketball players go over there, you know, to play right, overseas. Look at Kobe. Like, Kobe was. Oh, Kobe well, was I mean, Kobe, but e even like. Um, like uh lebron not so well much. Uh, like amare stoudemire though like when he was towards the end of his career and he went over there like they love it that is really well, who was huh. it mark who will who was it marbury stephen stephen marbury was the one that went and made a big career over there he went over there and won a couple championships that's right the whole thing but they are you know they are crazy about western culture and it's kind of sad actually when i was in japan I was talking to, I went into this antique store one time and I was talking to this young kid and his father had the business, but he was working in his father's shop. And I pointed out some Japanese antique and I said, man, I said, that's really pretty piece. I said, you know, I was talking about the piece and he goes, um, we don't want any of that old shit. And I kind of looked at him. He was like 20, 21 years old or something. And he goes, we just want to be like you we just want to be like westerners we want to be like americans and i used to kind of get a little kind of like do you really you really want to be just like us you know what i mean it was kind of interesting conversations to have yeah where they're going everything about america is the greatest thing in the world and i'm like everything that's in america came from china so <laughs> or japan back yeah, in the yeah. day right Every, yeah. i mean when i was a kid everything was made in japan you know and then that changed and went to China. But yes, the Asians, especially the young culture, they want to be just like the Americans. Huh. That's very interesting because obviously, uh, really all of those countries have such deep, rich historical culture there. And America being such a young country, respectively, I suppose we don't as much, but there is interesting i think i think you know what i think it is i think it's just the reverence that americans have for their cultural history only basically goes back to their lifetime so it's almost like a reset for each generation and then and of course that has historically never been the case in asia where a lot of those countries again have so much emphasis on um ancestry and you know your roots and remembering the the things that have happened to your family and your country and tradition is what i'm trying absolutely to say. yeah absolutely yeah the young culture you know they they think that we're the greatest things in the world and it's kind of sad you know because <laughs> we certainly aren't you know what i mean yeah we certainly aren't especially not now yeah not what we used to be for sure yeah yeah that's a, yeah, that's very huh. That is interesting. You you want to get into the who would win? Yeah, I think we should. Oh, okay. Yeah. Alrighty. 
Um, so uh, the who would win of the win? Who? What is it? What <laughs> who is would it win the win? The who would win of the win? The uh, who would win of the week this week is the Jolly Green Giant versus the Stay Puff Marshmallow Man. First question up top: Is the Jolly Green Giant still around? I think only in the advertising world. In the history <laughs> yeah. of advertising, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I mean, he was a, like, I loved those commercials and stuff when we were growing up, and like I remember seeing him on cans of creamed corn and things yeah, like that. Yeah, and creamed corn was the best. Creamed. I haven't seen a can of creamed corn in years, and Me I either. used to love creamed corn. Yeah, it was just like. <laughs> Oh, it was so good. It was like sugary, sugary, soupy corn. What was the um, Green Giant? What was that? Remember that? Oh, like, it was a. Uh, it was him. It was like ho ho ho, Green, green Giant. Green. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And I, it's those, it's those phrases that you remember as kids. Yeah. Go, oh yeah, yeah. And I think that that, I think a big determining factor in this fight is diet, because. I can't imagine the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man eats a lot of vegetables. No, that I suppose that's true. Whereas true. the Jolly Green Giant is legitimately just one giant vegetable, pretty much. Well, but couldn't the Jolly Green Giant just do the classic fall on him? I think it wouldn't f- even really have to be a fight, right? The Jolly Green Giant could just l- land on the marshmallow guy, and the marshmallow guy would just turn into a puddle i don't know i think the i think the state puff marshmallow man is a little bit more durable than that i think yeah. honestly he's and the in, worst guy that you could fall on because of how how puffy he is hashtag stay puff he bounced right off of him well in terms of ghostbusters we're talking about a giant stay puff marshmallow man though, yeah yeah, if yeah that of were course the case. Oh. well oh, right wait, if you're going yeah but look at i mean but the jolly green giant you truthfully never knew how big he was no because he went off into the clouds. Yeah, that's also true. So he could be badass. He, he could big. be stories yeah. high. You know what I mean? He is also, but he is also a gentle giant. I don't think violence is necessarily in his nature. Yeah, no, but that's, that's why I was thinking you just fall on him. Yeah, but I also <laughs> think you know, for his, the, his lifestyle to me is that of you know a healthy probably athletic person. That's how I imagine the Jolly Green Giant, and I imagine the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man. The complete opposite. I think he plays it dirty, though. I think the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man fights at dirty. First, at first, maybe yes, but I think that he runs out of gas fast, and he's ready for a nap. You well, know, the other part of it too. Couldn't the marshmallow just wrap himself around the green giant? Absorb him like a gelatinous absorb, cube. Like a gelatinous cube. Shout out to Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> <laughs> um, eh, it would be tough. I think that you know. That can argument could make. Can you even really hurt this? Like, if you punch the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man, though, would that? E- what can he you even would feel have pain? to? You would have to <laughs> dismember him. I would assume. But he would fight to the end because I honestly, or no, he does feel pain because he does get irritated. Or Ghostbuster, so okay, you, there's you evidence You put a little that. heat on him. You get a little fire started. Well, how, uh, Jolly Green Giant doesn't want to start a forest fire. I think that's if, the last if thing it's, he wants if to it's, do. If it's life or life or death, though. Maybe it's not that far, but the Jolly Green Giant doesn't want to doesn't want to lose. You don't have to kill him, but you can make him, you know, a, a perfect golden brown, and he's not going to be comfortable. <laughs> what was was he an asparagus? Is that what he was? I think yeah, he was, or a I broccoli was, stem. Or I think like it was part of asparagus. I think it was mo- the mostly the genetic makeup of the Jolly Green Giant was asparagus. That's what I That's think. That's what I think too. That's kind yeah. of what I'm remembering right what yeah yeah it's, it's, what kind it's of virtually a super food asparagus is apparently <laughs> according to the internet the new cure for hangovers oh I have yeah. heard that one before mm-hmm. that's interesting yeah there's some type of mineral in it or something like that again i only read the the heading of the article sure yeah <laughs> yeah you're not talking by experience you didn't uh no 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 haven't no, tried no. it yet but it's i will say I, i've i've been more inclined to eat asparagus li- lately. I used to be very <laughs> anti-asparagus. Asparagus has well, grown on winter, me. And it's winter time in Buffalo, so the drinking has to have risen in the winter time with all the snow. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, well, we go pretty hard for, even. In I was going to say you drink for different reasons. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, drink for different. Well, winter reasons. time is always a good one to like. You know. Yeah, yeah. I'm not gonna, you know go that far but it's so it can be more of a depressing reason to drink whereas in the summertime it's like we got to be outside and you can't go outside without having a drink 
So we used to, when I lived in Edinburgh, it was so funny because it would be like May 1st and there'd still be snow on the ground. Oh yeah. But if the sun were out and it was like over 40, yep. we'd be out on our, out on our towels in bathing suits in 40 degree weather just because the sun was out. Yeah. And right on. Yep. You're right on the you lake. Just lay there That's go, the, uh... well, there's a snow drift like two feet from my head, but it didn't matter because the sun was out. Uh-uh. <laughs> that is, I want to touch on that. Well, let's wrap up this. Who would yeah, win sorry, real quick? Sorry, I got we'll distracted. lock. We'll lock in. I think even though I've been rooting for Stay Puff, I think the athletic prowess of the Jolly Green Giant would somehow find its way to a victory. Yeah. I and 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 the falling theory I thought about for a while, but I do think that the Stay Puff Marshmallow Man is probably like very malleable. Oh, so I think that he could, you know, find his way to slide out of there, but I think ultimately there's no way he can keep up. You know, even if their sizes are remotely close, which we're unsure of, because um, we do our homework, and uh, I think that just his ability to to continue going when the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man is ready for a cheeseburger and a nap would give the Jolly Green Giant a win. Because he'd have more energy. Yes. Because <laughs> of all that iron. Yeah. He mm-hmm. is. <laughs> Yeah, it's can of spit Popeye style, man. Popeye style. Yeah. Oh, Popeye'd be a good one for a who would win. Yeah. Popeye style. So I'm gonna lock in the Jolly Green Giant as well. Yeah. What Sounds do you think? Cool. Sounds good to me. Sounds good. <laughs> That's a clean sweep. Jolly Green Giant. Vote on that on Instagram on Friday. Who would win of the week? Jolly Green Giant versus the Stay Puff Marshmallow Man. Hashtag Stay Puff. <laughs> but uh, you, what, what? It's um, interesting. You could do a t- you could do a show. What you're talking about. You oh yeah, do an animated reality show where these things met each other, and f- just like UFC and all that kind of shit. Yeah, yeah, we've talked Turn about that forward. before because there used to be some show. I think it was at least the show I'm thinking of. I think it was like Celebrity Deathmatch. I don't know if that's what show it was, but there was some show where they would um, plug in like certain statistics of people. Oh, they did an Animal Planet version, too, that was really I, cool. They plug in statistics of these animals, and then they would do a 3D rendering of that actual fight. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think of it like We'd Mortal Kombat style. We'd have to get Kombat the license for a lot of yeah, I don't know. characters, I, though. And some I, folks would yeah. not be into... I can definitely send emails. Uh, that's about as far as my tech uh, knowledge goes, so we'd have to find somebody to do it for us. But we did have that theory. We... Uh, We've had a couple different ideas like that. We've had some fun who would win of the weeks. Um, yeah. How about, how about, um, I was just thinking of Popeye. Popeye against, oh, I lost it. Sorry. No, I, that's. I had a good fight in my head and it flew right out the door. Which we sit I there mean, yeah. for extended <laughs> periods of time and say just the stupidest shit out loud. That's like, that <laughs> would not, ne- yeah. Well, <laughs> Andrew uh, seems to like every idea he's ever had, but let me be honest with you guys, he's had some them, bad But a lot, of them, a lot of them are great. Yeah. I'll get texts randomly throughout the week that are just the most absurd thing <laughs> that you could possibly imagine. I think Gordon Ramsay versus an overcooked scallop with a handgun is still on the table. <laughs> yeah. See, like, I don't I don't know about that one. Could the still one that I eventually. did succumb to was Wolverine versus oh, Mike, Mike Tyson if he had thumbtacks in his boxing gloves. Oh. Which would never work <laughs> because Wolverine regenerates. He's virtually immortal. Well, whatever. You know, yeah. we're, uh, we're having yeah. a good time. Yeah, exactly. What are you doing? Exactly. I wanted to ask, um, because you talked about the theme park, and that was one thing that I thought was really cool, because I had read somewhere that you had part to do with like some water slides there as well, or a water slide there. Yeah, I did a water. Well, I went to Landmark Corporation, who at the time was doing theme parks all over the world. They were a huge, huge company when the when the um, theme park thing exploded in Asia was in like the early 90s. And there was a company called Landmark Entertainment, and they were doing a bunch of them, all different themes all around Southeast Asia. And they were doing one in um, Japan in a little town called Beppu. And it was Harmony Land. And it was done by the Sanrio company who does Hello Kitty. So it was a Hello Kitty theme park. That's what it was. 
happen. And so I was, the project was at its ups and downs and they had money issues and they had logistic issues and everything. And they were going through people like there is no tomorrow to do these theme parks. And so they were looking for bodies to go to Japan. And I'm like, I'd do, you know, I'll go anywhere. I'll do anything for work. I don't really care. So I was like, yeah, I'd love to go to Japan and do this. So then I found out that when I get down there, that they were like, 12 people through this ride that they assigned me to. Whoa. <laughs> and I kept trying to find out what the problem was with the ride. <laughs> and so they basically, the ride that I had was way kind of, was probably three quarters of a mile from our offices. And it was down this hill and it was all winter time and it was muddy and everything. Well, nobody really would want to go down to where this ride was. So I would go down with a cruise and I started to put, so what they did is I got hired to do an install for them. So the building was built, but the pieces to the ride weren't in yet. It was just a concrete building with a concrete river going through it. And then I had to go in and take the model that they had a conceptual artist do, and I had to make it work. And so the building, the problem that everybody was having was the building was the wrong size from the drawings. And so all the scenic pieces didn't fit. And so basically what people were doing, they were so afraid to make up their mind about how to make it work that people kept quitting. Wow. Well, I was stupid and I didn't know any better. So I thought, well, I know how to do this. <laughs> and so I just went in and I started working on the ride from the beginning. And it told the story of this whole character through this water ride, right? And you go to like these different segments. So I would just go through and I would put as many elements as I could. And then when the building ran out, I would just take the shit and throw it in a pile outside the building. So we did a walkthrough one day with the corporate people and they came through and they said, man, this is looking great. We're so happy, blah, blah, blah. I said, terrific. And I just walked away and my boss happened to come by and he walked out the back of the building and saw this big pile of scenery out there. And he went, well, what's all that? And I said, doesn't fit and he went well it has to fit and i said well that's a lovely thing to say but <laughs> it doesn't fucking fit so i you know it's either too tall too wide too deep or whatever so i just cut all this shit out of this set and the and the owner came through and he goes well this looks brilliant whereas my boss was going well it doesn't match the drawings and i'm going well neither does the building so what do you want yeah you want to rebuild the building now or do we want to turn around and start all over again what do you want to do oh, is there a secret man. miley cyrus closet somewhere in here that we can put more space in or no yeah so i lasted a couple weeks on that and then it was so funny because everybody the project was running out of money and it was getting harder and harder and a bunch of people were quitting and they came to me and they said well since you did such a great job on that we would like you to stay i said well what you know what do you want me to do what's you know and they said, well, we want you to be in charge of four other theme park rides. And I said, okay. I said, so how much more are you paying me to do this? And they said, oh, no, we're not giving you any more money. <laughs> oh we just want God. you to stay and have more responsibility. Yeah. And I went, Fuck <laughs> yeah. And I'm saying, I'm not, this is stupid. I'm but not, you know. That's not I'm how not that works. Punish, I'm not here to punish myself. Yeah. No. It was like going, get out of here. I'm not, you know, yeah. the pressure and the stress of those things, because there's so much money involved, you know, and yeah. a thing like Sanrio, like Hello Kitty is like the Bible to us, yeah. you know, in, in Japan. So God forbid, if you paint Hello Kitty's tail the wrong color or something like that, I mean, you can't do anything like that. Yeah, right. They'll jump on there. They're as strict with Hello Kitty as we are with Mickey Mouse, as yeah. far as, you know, the drawing and the shape and all that kind of stuff. And, was that the first time you'd ever worked on something like that, like a ride compared yep. to, and yep. did it at all spark your interest to ever, you know, consider doing more stuff like that? Or w was it kind of too stressful of experience and you, you no, enjoyed it? I thought it? about it for a little bit, but the problem is, is that I was going to end up, I had been on the road with the Miss Universe pageant for like four years. Yeah. And I was on the road for eight months a year for four years. Well, when you've lived in hotels for eight months a year for four years, you're pretty fucking sick of travel, you know, yeah. at that point. It was like, and they were like, well, you could stay in Japan, you know, you could come and move to Japan and be there for like a year and a half. Well, I wasn't ready to like give up Hollywood just yet. Yeah. It really wasn't, you know, the whole theme park thing. And then the good thing was, is like five years later when the stock market took a shit and all those theme parks got all shut down, 
that whole business dried up like literally within a couple of weeks they stopped everything in in asia yeah wow i made a i made a better choice by coming home clearly and then i saw that you had you've done some different things with restaurants as well too d- design like some more interior design stuff yeah i'd love to do more i've done a couple of restaurants for some friends of mine um you got something to write with uh Type. Emily, does, oh, yeah, yeah, our yeah. our producer does, so we'll make her write it down. All right, so check out. Can you go on the internet on that monitor you have right there? Yes, we can do that. All right. I was going to say, I can look it up, yeah. All right, go to jerrysworld.info. Oh, yeah, I looked this up. This is my gaming center. This is going to be this is gonna be something that we're going to build one, hopefully, in 2023. It's a um, It's a digital playground for people of all ages for kids from little kids up through grandparents. And it's going to be the new family entertainment center, but all based on technology. So where you'll be able to go, we have an esports league there. We have an esports team set up. Oh, wow. We're going to do a, we're going to basically, what I'm trying to do is a Vegas casino atmosphere for esports and gaming and put them around the country. That so puts them in every major city. But so the idea is that, and the theme, when you look at the, the video of it, the theme of them is as if you're being shot onto the floor of a pinball game. Yes. And there's gaming stations and there's VR stations and AR stations and, you know, vintage. We have some vintage gaming areas and all kinds of things. Oh, that so sounds we're gonna... awesome. So this is my dream is Jerry's world is my dream thing is to be done with Hollywood and go do Jerry's world for a couple of years and then retire. That sounds unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a way to go. People, what once people start to really um, understand what can be done by going to VR centers and things like that, like how good these places can actually look, how real they can actually feel, that's going to take over everything, man. Yep. Yeah. So what we want to do, right, is. Um, you know, like bowling leagues when you were kids, that there were bowling alleys, I'm sure, in Buffalo, right, where you had... Yeah, Andy Andy was a bowler, Saturday bowler. mornings, yep. So you, so you have a kids' league, and you have the parents' league, and you have couples' leagues, and all that kind of stuff. So we want to do all this with esports and gaming. Which is... So that's that, genius. So that the little kids, your little brother or sister, can come in, and we're going to have big um, oversized iPads up on the wall where you could create artwork for little kids. And the parents can play games and the kids can go play AR, VR stuff. We'll have a military section where you can turn around and play violent games. We're going to turn around and do family stuff. So we're we're going to create the entertainment center of the future with Jerry's World. Which sounds awesome. And we, we actually had the opportunity to do like a, a VR game type thing um, one time in Florida. Do you remember? Yeah. And it was so cool that was and it was i was gonna say and it was like basic basic stuff but being able to do it was unbelievable so i can only imagine where it's at now and i'm not i'm not a huge well i play a lot of video games i'm not very good at video games um but it's crazy how popular video games in general are esports is huge i mean sports has always been my you know thing i guess i'll call it specifically hockey and learn as as i got older and learned more about the sports industry and stuff like that the way that esports has taken over is insane well yeah yep absolutely well and what we're going to do is we're going to have an esports training center in these places so kids will be able to learn gaming learn how to play games and things like that so we're really trying to make this a play you know because now especially the covid's over Everybody wants to be in community now. Yep. And now that everybody's been with their family, now their families want to be in community. So I want to get a place like where your family can come and your family can come. Your girlfriends, your wives can hang out and do something. Your parents can go do something else. The kids can go do something else. But yet it's in a place where families are together. And I think that's a really important thing going forward. Yeah. That sounds awesome. And Andrew had actually mentioned that to me before we started so i'm glad we got to talk about that because i was gonna you know bring up what's kind of next and and i was hoping that was going to be the answer and that sounds so cool yeah that's my that's that's my big kind of tada, so to speak and what i'm hoping is because i got some other things i want to do so i want to make some yep. money out of this yep. and get on to the next thing yeah fair enough yep. fair enough 
that's going to change ev- that's going to yeah. change everything just the just that one aspect of approaching esports having like a a little league version of that where you can like i mean that's that's a uh, wow! Like that's gonna be so massive, especially because people are already getting scholarships and things like that for video games at certain schools. Right. And, and parents see, what are. What we're gonna do is we're talking to manufacturers now, right? Because what we want, I don't want the com- I don't want you coming to my place to play on the computer you play on at home. I want you to come in and have an esports high def yeah. setup, right? So you're not just kind of playing what you could do at home. You're getting to play on the best monitors with the best equipment. And that's what we think will get people out of their houses because they'll be able to use equipment that they can't afford at home. Good internet connection, which I do not have, <laughs> which is a big reason why I'm right. horrible All at video games. Of, yeah. All those things that make it challenging, we want to make it easy yeah. and make it in a community spirit. It, it, and it sounds so cool. And on top of how cool you know the the experience will be, you talking about you know that the pinball kind of idea and your ability to design these environments that will a- add so much to that experience sounds incredible. Well, have you guys been to Vegas before? Have you been to Vegas? No. no. All right. So the first time you go to Vegas, you can't help but be in awe. Yeah. You walk into a casino the first time and you're like, what is this? I've never been any place like this. So what I want to do is create that atmosphere for a family entertainment center so that people in Kansas City can go and people in Miami can go and they don't have to go to Vegas. You don't have to be all part of that. You can do it in your hometown. So that's the that's the thought process behind all of it. Which is an unbelievable idea. Um, Andy. Yeah. Um, we're getting up to about that time. Yep. Um, but I don't want to cut you off before you get no, out. No, no. I, uh, I just appreciate you giving us uh, this much of your time, Jerry. Um, it's been really great talking to you. And, My pleasure, uh, guys. It's great to talk to you, too. Yeah. Um, so I think um, real quick, uh, if you want to plug, obviously, jerrysworld.info. People should check out that site. Um, your Instagram as well and your site, your personal Jerry site. Dunn Design on Instagram. And uh, jerrydunn.design is my website for my television work. I just saw that picture you posted today of the um, Charlie Sheen bedspread. <laughs> our little our little stalker set that we did, yeah. <laughs> is that, uh, just real quick on that, is that something that, um, how easy was that to make now, and would that have been something back in the day that would have been kind of a hassle to put together? Yeah, it would have been a big hassle. Like 20 years ago, it would have been a pain in the neck. Now with most of the technology, like I have a buddy of mine who owns a graphics company over about half hour from here. Well, he is a printer that'll print 26 foot goods by a hundred yards. So you could <laughs> print anything. I mean, you're talking about, he could print a backdrop that'll cover a football field. Yeah. That's how big his printer is. Holy so shit. The, the technology is everywhere now. And so it's just a matter of whether you can find it and you know, how you use it and all that kind of stuff. That's a big ass printer. Um, <laughs> but Like Andrew said, thank you so much for taking the time and coming on here. It was awesome. Um, I mean, really, a lot of, you know, especially that Disney Channel stuff, uh, the Fuller House stuff, like that was that was our childhood. So to be able to hear the different things that go into that is is unbelievable. And and we can't thank you enough for coming on here. It was great. Thanks for having me, guys. You guys have a great day. Okay. yeah, Yeah, you you too. All right. Take care. Yeah. Have a good one. You too. Bye bye. Yes, sir. Andy. I love you. Me too. Let's get out of here.